agent and the project director of the Ultra Niche Project. Um, Dave Van Borst is the president of the Cape May County Beach Plum Association and um, one of the largest farmers of beach plums in the state. Country. And Michael Craig is one of the family owners of the Washington Inn. So if anybody wants to go ahead and get started, raise your hand if you have any questions and I'll bring the mic to you and you can uh, become famous. <laughs> What, what have you found to be the optimum uh, temperature to freeze beach plums? Uh, I, th I think it, it, it depends on how long they're gonna, you're going to store them. If you're going to store them uh, temporarily, um, it can be um, you know, you know, in and around zero. But in, for long term, you want, you want the, the colder, the better. So um, if you're producing within the, you know, a six-month period, the the freeze temperature is isn't relevant. So it's a zero Fahrenheit. Yeah. Zero Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. um, and also, how long have you found that you can keep them in a frozen state um, before they get like freeze or burn or they start degrading? Well, you, well, you have to you have to check them. The good thing um, about the beach plums, similar to the cranberries, is that the skin you know the skin is is thick. You know, so there, there is a protective, uh, you know, a protective layer. Um, but uh, we've, we've done tests uh, where we've frozen for two years and there, there was no discernible, you know, difference, especially if you're, if you're you know, doing a maceration. <coughs> and, and, and also with, uh, um, uh, with uh, jams and jellies too, because you change the profile when you cook it. You know, the, the profile gets changed, and when you add sugar, everything changes as well. That's great. Thank you. Um, the, uh, uh, the, um, the deep pitting, that's done afterwards. Like, you freeze them as soon as you get them, and then when you are ready to use them six months later, that's when you deep pit them? Yes. Well, we do it both ways. If we have time, we will, uh, and we've, we've had a, it's, they're called, it's a, called a pulper finisher. And it's uh, it, it's a uh, actually the one that we that we bought was uh, manufactured in the 70s, I think, uh, for for uh, fruit production, uh, pit fruit, and uh, so we'll do we'll um, we found that that it's easier for us to control batches by hand sieving it, so we hand sieve it when we want to, we want puree right away, because there are there are those uh, Batches of fruit that are perfect in in the sweet the sweetness of the of the juice. You can you can take them and sieve them, and it's it's actually the the uh, the puree is sweet. It's tasty and delicious. Other fruit that uh, has less sugar, you need to um, cook it a little bit to soften it up. Add sugar sometimes. We don't like to add sugar, but sometimes you have to. So, thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> what was the on that one? Was it 22? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, you said you start checking August 1st. How long does the harvest usually last? The wild seedling beach plums are very diverse. <coughs> we traditionally have always started the first week in August and it actually runs through the month of August and into September on the individual <laughs> trees. This also presents a real problem with following the proper spray pattern because of the diversity because there are sprays that are applied in early bloom they can't be applied at petal after, until after petal fall <laughs> and when you have the diversity within a row of trees it's very very difficult so you have to kind of look for the optimum time for your spray schedule. Yeah, that's one reason we're moving towards clones because if you uh, get a clonal variety, like the new Rutgers beach plum variety that was released, then they'll all flower and fruit at the same time. But then, you know, in Dave's situation, he can use his labor um, each, you know, there's a few trees each week he needs to harvest. 
but in, if you use clones, then you'll have to harvest all at the same time, the same way you have to be able to spray everything. So there's pluses and minuses to using different systems. And the harvester, that was what type of harvester? Out of Still Europe? Chainsaw Company okay. makes that harvester for harvesting olives in Europe. Okay. Yeah, it, Thank it's you. Discontinued. And it's discontinued in North America. I got three of them. Michael got one of my three. <laughs> yeah. I have three different varieties of beach plums. Does that cause a problem in cross pollinating them, or they should be okay? They should be okay. I, I do I've not. I've had difficulty the last two years with. So have I. <laughs> so it shouldn't matter. That Michael can attest to this. We have a, uh, another grower that Michael deals with in Federalsburg, Maryland. And coincidentally, we had uh, a bumper harvest three years ago, last year. It was terrible. And it was consistent from Federalsburg, Maryland, up through the lower part of the county, on up the coast to Island Beach State Park, which has a beach plum festival. And this year was not a lot better. We're not sure, as it mentioned in the video, that they tend to be biannual, which means they'll have one good year, one bad year. That can be alleviated with proper pruning. This year's fruit sets on last year's new growth. So if anyone says, oh, I don't like to prune, you're not gonna have any fruit. You have to cut them back every year and the new growth that year will be the fruit producing growth of the following year. Like grapes said. Has to be pruned. I'm not a grape farmer, but. <laughs> also, also the, uh, the, one of the, the tricky things to trying to figure out, we're all, we're, all of us who grow beach farms are really trying to figure out what the deal is. And uh, the, bloom, uh, the bloom of the plant is in that what is it, second week of, uh, third week of, uh, of April, April through, right. through maybe the middle of, of May. And, and from a weather standpoint, this is a really uh, terrible time for us because it's cloudy, it's rainy, it's windy, uh, bee, Gary, bees aren't out, and, and, and we, you know, we need the pollination. And, um, and so we look at, at years where we didn't ha have a good crop with that, that have, we say, okay, well, that's because it rained the whole, the whole time that the, the blossoms were out. And then, and then that sounds good. And then we have years where we've got perfect weather and you know, we, have, we don't have a strong crop either. So we, we just mm -hmm. trying, everyone's trying to figure out exactly what the reasons I are. And, I don't see the diversity in the bloom that I do in the harvest. And that's the result of the individual trees. They may bloom at the same time, but they each individually ripen X number of days after the fact. Some of them are longer intervals than other. Can you add anything about the, uh, during the bloom? with the pollination study and, and what uh, we were talking about. <clears throat> yeah, actually on a beach plum plant, um, different flowers will be in different stages at the same time. So it's not just variability from tree to tree, but some of the plants. I know there was one at, at your place that we were doing the research on where it was so variable that I couldn't even conduct the pollination uh, properly because uh, there were so many different flower stages going on on the plant at the same time. And would that, would that uh, be cor uh, correlate to a, a tree's uh, different ripe, uh, degrees of ripeness within the tree of the berries up at harvest time? It might, but you know, like Dave is saying, you're never really sure based on when it flowered, when it's going to produce fruit. I guess some trees are going to take a longer time they than others. They have a others. longer time to maturity than yeah. others. The diversity of the bloom is not as severe as the diversity of the harvest. And that is the one reason that we're working the Beach Plum Association in conjunction with a license that we obtained from Rutgers University for a selection called BP1. And that was collected, we're assuming, in the North Jersey, Island Beach State okay. Park mm -hmm. area back in- The 80s, 1980s. 1980s. <coughs> superior in size, yield, quality of fruit, 
brick content, sugar content of the fruit. And we entered into a licensing agreement with Rutgers for propagation of that tree. Um, also, the, uh, we obtained sky and wood from that tree, from Rutgers, and we now in the process of, in fact, we've, done, we've grafted it into uh, rootstock. Now, I, I'll, I'll go a little further. We are attempting to reduce the diversity by, we are grafting into two different plum rootstocks, Mirabulin plum and Mariana. Mariana. The reason for that is the uh, native wild seedling beech plum tends to uh, sucker very severely. Suckering are new growth coming up from the roots and under the canopy or wherever the root, uh, roots are. And I think that evolved from the uh, evolution of survival in the severe, harsh, dune conditions where it grows in the wild. By grafting into other prunus rootstocks, we even experimented with peach rootstock. We're trying to perhaps reduce the, the uh, uh, severity of the diversity. One thing, when we're, the jury's still out on it yet, but we are, uh, the data so far has shown that these trees are, are developing more like uh, the uh, semi-dwarf fruit trees rather than growing, as you saw mine, were very mature, large trees. And this uh, question is for Michael Craig. What was the hardest challenge for the marketing of the product itself, for the beach bombs themselves? Well, I think, I think the, the biggest challenge is that it can't be a commodity product. So, you know, the, the product that, that is the best selling product is a jam and a jelly. And however, you know, jams and jellies are commodity products and you know, people buy them at, you know, $3 for a, a jar that comes from France or whatever. And, um, you know, so, so I think that the, the, chal the challenge is to, is to keep it local but make it art artisanal and in, in uh, this uh, this is a, a second label for us here to try to make it artis artisanal um, and uh, you know I think that our best selling product is the vinegar and we hand we hand write the label so um, I guess outside I, I think the biggest challenge is bringing beach plums outside of the marketplace because it, it means nothing to anybody. We, we, um, we went up to the Fancy Food Show in New York and we had a table at the Fancy Food Show. And, you know, being naive, I thought, oh, wow, we're going to have a lot of interest. People are, you know, gonna, people going to just, you know, be in love with it. And most people didn't care because it had no story. It had no relevance to them. Uh, so the, you know, the best place to market uh, the product is is locally is in you know in a farmer in the farmers market or in the produce uh, stand kind of environment uh, we do sell a lot uh, uh, at our store on the Cape May Mall but again it's 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 a tourist interest because we label it it's Cape May beach plum um, so I, I would say uh, in answer to your question Joe the, the biggest challenge is is taking it and making it a relevant product outside the immediate area where it's but where once people taste it they really enjoy it if you guys want to look at the voting you can see um, I actually put one of the beads in in each cup so the one that had I will never try it again that was not a real vote and so was the somewhat like it uh, section <laughs> and um, Joe Alvarez in the back and I have been doing taste testings all over the state I even did some in other states um, and people overwhelmingly liked beach plums, said they would try them again. Um, a lot of people rated the product very high quality. Um, that's Michael's product over there, you see. So once people get to know about it, then that's when they really like it. But they kind of need to taste it or have a little bit of an idea about the history of the crop before they are more interested in it. The one thing I like about 
uh, marketing to Michael is that he, he wants a diversity. He wants to, as he refers to profiles, the individual profiles, to come up with more consistent of a blend rather than one tree as opposed to the other tree because of the diversity within it. And once I put in the sorting equipment and the cleaning equipment, the quality that I was bringing you was much better, wasn't oh, it? Uh, uh, as I said in the, in the video, uh, the, the relationship that Dave, Dave and I have had, he's, he, was, he was always understanding our needs. The first couple of years, we uh, you know, were getting, taking the, uh, the beach plums and they had the leaves in and we would, we would put them in soak tanks so that the, the, uh, the, the mummy uh, dried out fruit would float and the leaves would float and then we would, we would take that out and then have to strain it. And, and uh, he said, you know, he was like, he was like this uh, MacGyver genius. And, and he says, oh, I, I think I, I know how to figure out this, uh, this <laughs> you know, this uh, leaf situation. And you saw the, the, the lugs of his fruit were just impeccable. And, um, and that's, that's the, the, the back and forth that's been really, really successful. And he, and he is always trying to, you know, close the, close the gap on, in tightening up the quality that he, he produces. And, and his, his, uh, his orchard um, is much more, has much more challenging because we didn't know. Our friend down in, in Fredericksburg, Maryland that they referred to, he, he was a, did his PhD at Cornell University and got a, is it, uh, is it Jen, is it a SEER grant? Is that the? SEER, S-A-R-E-C-E. He got a SEER grant and he traveled from Virginia all the way up to uh, the, the coast of Maine and he, at, in harvest time, and he picked and took cuttings of all the best wild beach plums that he could fi find, and then they took them up and propagated them in, in New, York, New York State. So this guy has a, you know, a lot of, he knew about grafting and all this. Dave's, Dave's orchard, he, he bought uh, uh, plant material that, that you know, he didn't know. And so, so it's been very difficult for, for Dave and the challenges that he's, He's had to overcome. It's it's uh, you know it's amazing to, to, to see how he how he's how he's produced and what he produces. So, I started out with a thousand trees. Uh, Four hundred of them came from an, uh, the, a source, actually that originated at Higby's Beach. I've since torn those trees out because of the quality of the fruit. It was a very small small fruit. It was a low proportion of pulp to the pit size. Uh, very small in size. I, those trees are gone and I'm in the process of replacing them with this grafted material. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been grafting fruit trees for hundreds if not a thousand years. They've been doing grapes for many thousand years and the blueberries were developed, a commercial blueberry in New Jersey by Elizabeth White in the 1920s. 30s. Mm -hmm. 1920s, yeah. And we're on just at the dawn of doing anything with beach plums. There was some work done in Massachusetts in the 30s. There was an organization formed there that made some selections in Massachusetts and down into New Jersey. One of those varieties that they identified was the Hancock. Dave Rowell in the back of the room is raising Hancock beach plums right now, grafted stock. We were able to get some of that cyan wood. Right now, it's at the Arnold Arboretum in Harvard University. But the, the success of fruit production is going to be in these selections and the grafting. Thanks for the plug, Dave. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were in the back earlier. <laughs> All right. Jenny, uh, thank you so much for doing this. And I just, I'm going to opportunity often enough to tell you how much I appreciate what you've oh, done. Oh, thanks, Dave. And Dave, you as well. And Michael, I joined the Beach Plum Association. You haven't mentioned it yet. I highly recommend it to anybody that wants to grow these things because through that effort and the, and the things that you folks have shared, we've been able to, to be quite successful with our plums. But I got a, um, 
pick a bone with you just a little bit. I, <laughs> I knew hand, you would. <laughs> I had to hand pick mine because that little machine Dave's got is <laughs> 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 kind of busy during the harvest season. And he did come over with it, but we were pretty much done. And you can actually hand pick them and, and, and do well. And then we got where we could do about five pounds an hour into a bucket with them. But I'll find a shaker one day. And Michael, I asked for the mic specifically because I'm curious about a couple things. Um, as our market grows, and we've got four or five customers now that are buying in small quantities that we hope will swell, I'm concerned about years when I won't be able to supply any fruit to them because I've seen the same thing you guys have seen, missed a whole season without anything from a late frost. We were fortunate this year, I think we were one of the few farms in the county that got over a thousand pounds of fruit. Um, and I noticed in the video, Dave, it's a shame that Jeff, I know. Jeff I wish didn't show up two years ago. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was taking three days picking 3,000 pounds of fruit, running them down to Michael. It was crazy. 3, and I, pounds I helped you for a couple days. Um, the question's about freezing again, and I never heard of a pulpar finisher, but I thought I had heard in a meeting a year or so ago that you were working with a concentrate as well. Is that true? That you, you're, you're still freezing the whole plum no. with the seed no, we, in it? No, we, 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 uh, we process uh, where we sieve. We sieve and we, we've, uh, back in the beginning, we would actually cook. We would actually cook the fruit and then sieve it and then bucket it and freeze it and then use it uh, that way. Because if, you're, if you, um, the, the, the challenge is moving the, moving the material when you, when you start getting a, a lot of volume. So we, were, we would freeze uh, the buckets, uh, five gallon buckets, and then that's how we would bring them to the, the, uh, the co-packer who was, who was making the, the jam and jelly. So, um, and then we, and then we've, we found uh, some other markets where we've sold the, the, um, the pulp to uh, jam and jelly producers as well. But the, you know the big thing the big thing with beach plums is that the the loss uh, once you, once you take that berry if it's if it's one of those berries that's big like the Hancock is big and juicy and sweet and it produces a lot of uh, uh, pulp you know your loss might be you know say twenty five percent but for many many of the berries your loss compared to the pit you might lose. 50, 50 to 60 percent, you know, and and so that for that reason, that's why um, uh, we we have to freeze because uh, uh, that's that's that that we could never could never keep up. And then once you once you do uh, puree, puree it, the um, the shelf life is much less than that protected berry. Right. So how long can you freeze it? Have you stored any for more than two years? No, no. But that's about. I mean, that's that. My ex, our experience is that there is no. So know, we can't stockpile a mountain of it in a warehouse to get through those years that we don't have anything. That's, that's, what he does. that's the real question. <laughs> well, I, no. I, I mean, I do. Oh, I mean, you do. I, I do. Okay. Okay. That's that's part of our our strategy, but then again, you know, also part of it is, you know, being being a team player. You know, when, when your supplier comes and says, okay, listen, I got this, you take, you, you take it because, you know, it's a give and take. So you, gotta, you have to, as the, as, the, uh, as the fabricator, you better figure out how to, how to find your market and, and sell your product or you're, you're in trouble. The good news, though, is that everyone will have the same problem. So <laughs> beach plums will be in short supply that year. You just have to educate your customer. You know, I am very what's happening. But go ahead. You just hit on my concern. I, I guess I didn't express myself. If we're going to build a market, we better be able to supply it because right. they're not going to wait oh, right. two or three years for fruit. And I'm seeing people want to build ice cream. We're working with gelata, whatever the heck that is, <laughs> Italian water ice, and all kinds of other products. And and my concern is what happens in that year? I don't have any fruit. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on uh, that pollination study that, so this year we figured out through the pollination study that they absolutely do need to be cross-pollinated, um, but now a new thing is coming up as to the frost damage and the cold damage in the spring, because we think that that has to do with it somehow, and maybe we're using the wrong pollinator. 
So right now we're using honeybees, which are not native to New Jersey, but the beach plum is native to New Jersey. Maybe there's um, a native fly or something like that that really it has a tight relationship with the beach plum. So maybe we're looking at the wrong pollinator. Maybe the flowers are more susceptible um, to cold damage at a certain time. Maybe we can avoid that by uh, cultivating certain types that are late flowering. So there's a lot of different options um, for, for solving that issue that, that everyone's experiencing with low supply during certain years. And um, the other day I was preparing a presentation where I was paralleling the development of the beach plum to the development of the blueberry. And I was so shocked at how many similarities they actually have. Um, in the early 1900s, New Jersey farmers thought the blueberry was completely un... There was no ability to grow blueberries in New Jersey <laughs> in, in the 19 early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And then in 1910, that's when they started doing... And they said the same thing. Oh, each one is different. <laughs> Only some taste good. You know, we have no idea how to propagate it. We have no idea how to grow it. Um, they didn't know about pH, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. So we've made a lot of strides in the last 14 years with the Beach Plum Association, you guys all working together, um, me trying to help out, you know, with, with getting it to this point. Because it was no, we could never could have made this video 10 years ago, right, Dave? Yeah. So there's I am, still stuff I am consider myself very fortunate to have Michael Craig as a source for my harvest. Um, I, looking forward, we've always uh, been striving to come up with a fresh fruit market for the road stands. And the problem with the diversity of the, of the individual trees, they don't lend themselves to a fresh fruit market because a person could pick one up and bite into it and spit it out. It's, too, it's not sweet enough, it's too bitter, it's too cranberry. And the next one might be great. So there's no consistency. The Hancock lends itself the best to fresh fruit market right now. BP1, the selection at Rutgers at Cream Ridge, is a large, sweet, uh, heavy yielding tree. And that we're looking at as our uh, future of, of the commercial market. On small scale growers, what I would recommend that you develop a uh, uh, rapport with a artisan jelly maker or something that's not doing a thousand cases but it's doing eight or ten or twenty or thirty cases of jelly or jam and develop develop a market with them for the smaller growers would you agree with yeah, that absolutely. would you Michael yeah and you know I mean this is the this is the thing that uh, I, I supply uh, the, a jelly maker puree and, they, and the jelly makers, they don't want to deal with the, 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 the raw fruit. They don't want the pits. They, you know, they want the puree. And, and what I, I, I asked her, because I, I know what it costs. If you buy the fruit it's, you know, and, and, and you process it, you're, you're looking at your cost about five, five bucks a pound, just you know, five to six bucks a pound just for the puree, to get to the puree. And so I asked her what, the, what she was paying. And, and well, yeah, I'm getting uh, uh, plum juice, you know, peach plum juice. And what she, was, what she was paying for was watered down or plum juice mixed with beach plum. You know, and, and that's, that's because it's so expensive to produce. I think, I think when Cornell University was selling, with, um, a, they, uh, it wasn't a concentrate, but it was, uh, it was cooked, it was co a cooked juice. Reduction, reduction, or, yeah, yeah, something, something like that. Um, you know, I think it was, it was like a hundred bucks a gallon, something, some, something like that. So, um, I think that getting back to your question about have, having to, enough to supply a market, I don't think we're, I don't think we're there. We're, we're not there yet. I, you know. Well, we're going to be, I think. <laughs> I mean, at least that's, I like to think. Being long term. You reminded me again. Remember when you first joined and you wanted yeah. to get trees? You wanted trees. Yeah. What did I keep telling you? Wait. Wait till we have something. Wait till we have some grafted stock. Okay. Dave, yes. there is anyone here that makes jam and jelly. I buy my pectin up at the Amish. Are we going to get pectin? 49 and bridge. Okay. Yeah. 
and it's so cheap for a big bag. Yeah. One third for each batch, one third of the sure gel. I don't pay what one little box costs yeah, in the right, Acme. Right. Mm -hmm. If anyone, plus you love the store. <laughs> my, my orchard is between the Garden State Parkway and Route 9 in Upper Township overlooking Corson's Inlet. Okay? People will ask, do they only grow next to the water? Do they only grow in New Jersey? Well, they grow from North Carolina to Maine on the coastal plain. They grow wild about a mile inland, although there are exceptions, okay? There are exceptions into the Pine Barrens area where they're further inland. They're more, uh, well, they're, they, I've never seen a wild beach plum, you know, north of Cape May County or uh, west of, of the Bay Shore. Uh, will they grow there? Yes, absolutely. The mere fact we're, we're grafting them into plum, <coughs> conventional plum and peach rootstock. Anywhere a peach tree or a plum would grow, <coughs> you need a well-drained soil, you need a sandy soil, and you need a pH of 6.5. The tree that we're, we're attempting to clone is growing in Queen, Cream Ridge, which is up in, is it Monmouth? Monmouth County. Monmouth yeah. County. It's not really sandy but on soil. But on the western side of Monmouth County. Yeah, it's not, not sandy the soil up there. It's in the middle of the state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. This what question. Would be the first time to spray for insects? Oh, wait, hold on one second so we can get the mic over there. I'm not sure. Can you ask it again? If you, the first the early dorm the early dormant spray is more for uh, oyster scale or different types of scale, but at first bloom, you want to begin your spray program. When the bloom now, someone told me before the bloom opens or before the flower shows. Well, there, there are the there's some different stage. There's a, a bud break stage, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but definitely, once they bloom, you want to have a big. Get, in fact. Uh, I forget who the uh, specialist oh, from Norm Rutgers. Lancet. Norm Lalancet. Norm Lalancet told me that the day the first one blooms, you begin that spray. That's program. a fungicide spray. Is the that's preventative. A yeah, because the um, the blossoms once they open, that's when they start getting infected with the monolinea, the brown rot fungus. I have that also. But there are other sprays you can apply even earlier into the bud, bud break and the green tip in different stages, yeah. but most critical one would be at the first bloom. And then it's all relevant to, to w weather conditions and everything, how often you repeat that. If you buy uh, Rutgers commercial uh, fruit guide, and it's available online also, isn't it? Yeah, it's available. That You can download the plum chapter for the free plum online. Chapter online. That's the, um, if you Google uh, Rutgers, I think it's Commercial Tree Fruit Production Guide. Um, it'll pop up. Bulletin EE02, I think it, the number is. A lot of the uh, recommended products are restricted use. You need a license to purchase them, but I'm not going to go into what homeowner sprays. I'm not familiar with those. Uh, this question is either to Jenny or to Dave. Um, you had mentioned the fact of uh, clonal varieties on uh, dwarf rootstock, and I know that it affects the, the height of the apple trees in the orchards uh, recently. So do you think that's going to have an effect on the way that it Jury's is? Jury's still out. According Jury's to Dr. Out. Warren Styles, it will. Okay. It is. It already has. So it's we have a member. I'm, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no. You're, you're, you're good. I wanted you to elaborate on anything that's going on right now research wise we have a member of the beach plum association who was retired he started his career at rutgers penn state state of maine ran an experimental apple uh, fac uh, facility in maine and ended up as fruit specialist for cornell university his name is dr warren styles he grew up on a <coughs> dairy farm in dias creek he is our ment he's my mentor Okay, he's well known almost globally, correct? Mm -hmm. Not just nationally or 
in this hemisphere globally as a fruit expert. He's written and published a number of volumes on, on uh, fruit production. And he's a member of our association, attends every meeting. He'd have been here tonight, but he just had a heart valve replaced two days ago. I'm surprised he let that stop him. <laughs> yeah, me too, <laughs> a little bit. Do you agree, Gary? I, I just want to introduce a couple of people. There's Gary, I'm not going to go into his name is Shemp. Uh, Steve, Joe Alvarez in the back with all the questions is the secretary of the Beach Plum Association. Les Ray is a, a founding member of the Beach Plum Association and grows beach plums in West Cape May. David Rao grows them in Belle Plaine. Did I miss anybody? Steve, did I get you? Yeah. Steve in the back, he just joined a year ago. Yeah. And uh, we meet the First Thursday of the month at 7 o'clock in this room. Has anyone attempted to grow these organically? Or is that not something that's... Of course you can. You can try. There's no reason you can't. <laughs> well, and still get a marketable crop. My opinion? <laughs> Honestly, yes. <laughs> there are a number of, you know, most people are misguided about organic. And if you ask anybody, what does organic mean? They say, oh, no fertilizer, no pesticides. Okay. There are organic pesticides that are approved for organic farmers. There are fertilizers that are approved and still legitimately call yourself organic. The BTs. Hmm? Do, you feel, do you feel they would be effective against the problems, the funguses and the insects and the blights and all that that you're dealing with, though? Dr. Stiles told me the secret to any successful organic farming operation is to begin with disease-resistant plants. You're not going to find any disease-resistant beach plums. They okay. haven't developed yeah. any yet. So <laughs> you're, you're already starting at a, at a disadvantage. <coughs> well, okay? Yeah. What I would recommend is Severe pruning, allow the sunlight in, allow the air movement in there, and look for some uh, uh, acceptable organic treatment. The, the brown rot and the cocolia are your two biggest enemies. Agreed? Mm -hmm. well, yeah, we're, at, we're at our, field, our, our field isn't, isn't organic, but we, don't, we use no, no chemicals. We use uh, um, compost. We use a, a, a compost to spray um, in the in the springtime, and you know the results are mixed. You know the results are mixed. We get plump curculio, uh, we do get brown rot, uh, but we get production of fruit. You know, and and like I th uh, what we what you have to do you understand is that uh, if you have ten trees, you have to figure well. I hope to get. Fruit off of how many, Dave? Three. <laughs> Two or three. <laughs> Two or three. So if, if, you, if, if uh, part of that mix is, uh, you know, because of insects, that's, you know. That's there are windows in the life cycle of the, that combine with the life cycle of the plant, and you may not get the cocolia damage because of the stage, right? But it's not going to be quite as... No, it's not, you're not, not, it's not going to be squeaky clean, you know. This cannot be your only income of money. What's that? This cannot be your only income of money. What do you do no, it's you? not. I'm retired. <laughs> what do you do when you get no crop one year? How are you living? Live on my pension from the state of New Jersey. <laughs> Forestry Department. <laughs> Division. Hi. You're not going to make a living. I am not in the size operation that I have. I, am, I have been in and out and involved in agriculture all my life. My father before me, my grandfather, back many, many generations. Okay, you can't, it is very difficult to make a living farming. What I will tell you that per acre, I've never made money farming like I have with beach plums. Okay, is it going to raise my family on it? No, maybe if I had more acreage and I had more buyers, yes. okay? 
Right, but is it, for a niche crop on an acre and a half, okay? So we only have a couple minutes left and I wanted to get to a question we have from Chester, New Jersey. Um, okay. Farmer up there wants to know if you can grow beach plums in the highlands. As long as it's not clay. As long as it's not clay, as long as it's a sandy soil, as long as it's well drained, there's, if he can grow peaches, there's no reason there is stone fruit. There's no reason he can't grow beach plums. Give me a little background. Where are you, where are you from? Cumberland. I ought to know you. I know you. Shepherd? No. I know who you are. I think. I. Okay. <laughs> okay. And the fellow next to you. Hi. He's my son. That's your son. Okay. You're the last dairy farm still in existence in Cumberland. Yeah. Okay. The last one in Burlington County just went out of business. Did you know dairy farm? I don't know who it is. I heard. I just heard that the last. Let's take a break. We have. We're going to take about a ten-minute break. We're going to come back and get started on the squat analysis. Okay. Break time. You making any money on dairy cows? <laughs> what I'm saying is, is, in Cape May County, we're never going to make it in the commodity. We're not going to grow. Hello everybody watching out there. We're going to be taking a quick break and coming back with our SWOT analysis in just about 10 minutes. So stay tuned. You're going to see th things moving around out there. But when we come back, um, please let us know in the questions section, the live chat section, if you're having any issues. And you can always reach out to us. And as a default, if anything happens, you can always refresh your browser. We'll see you soon. So one of our objectives with this program is to help you do a SWOT analysis for each crop. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about beach plums. How many people did their pre-reading homework? All the stuff in the email that Jen sent. Raise your hand. Okay, one person. <laughs> All right, so you get one of Michael's uh, jellies. You read half? All right, give her half a jar. <laughs> give her the open one. <laughs> um, she also has some really good questions. Okay. <laughs> so, um, if you didn't do the pre reading, I'm going to have to back up a little bit. All right, so SWOT analysis is a good way to tell between what you want to do and what you can do. Because in farming, we always have these really high goals, all these ideas we want to do. Um, but the reality is we only have so much money, we only have so much land, we only have so much labor. So the SWOT is a great way to kind of balance it out so you can make your idea practical and doable and you'll be able to make money off of it. And that's why we really like to use it in agriculture. Uh, it might seem like just an exercise on paper, but you'll be amazed if you actually go through the process how it really adjusts your thinking into making your idea practical and doable. So <clears throat> in SWAT, um, the, this, the S stands for strengths, the W is for weaknesses, and the O is for opportunities, and the T is for threats. Okay, so we're going to analyze all of these things um, with about beach plums for your farm or for your operation and if you don't have a farm still you can still do this even as if you don't have one um, it'll still apply so <clears throat> for strengths and weaknesses can anybody guess what they have in common with each other strengths and weaknesses these two Okay, so strengths and weaknesses are all internal. They're all things about you or your business. Um, it's about, you know, the, the assets that you have, and it's about the things that you should fix about yourself, the weaknesses. So these are all about you. How about opportunities, opportunities and threats? Yes. External. External, great. So 
this is kind of like the ocean that we live in, right? These are the things you can't control, the environment we live in, um, but there are opportunities out there that you could capitalize on, and there are threats out there that we need to figure out how to reduce those things on you. So what do strengths and opportunities have in common with each other? These two, strengths and opportunities. Even if you just think of the word, what do those two things have in common with each other? Positive. They're positive, thank you, Steve. So these things are positive, right? And what do weaknesses and threats have in common with each other? Yes, negative. So in business management, <clears throat> what we want to do is capitalize on these strengths and opportunities and we want to diminish the weaknesses and the threats. The weaknesses are under your control because they're things about you or your business. The threats, what you really just have to do is try to figure out how to minimize that effect on your business. So let's talk about minimizing threats a little bit. We call that risk management. <clears throat> what are some things that somebody can do to manage risk? There's four key options here. Shout anything out. Diversify, okay, that's, that's actually a good answer. Let me think which category that would go into. That would be under reduce, because when you diversify, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Okay. Okay, another one. Insure. Insure, that is a good one. That's under transfer. Because when you're insuring, you're basically making a bet with the insurance company and they're assuming the risk instead of you. So you're actually transferring legally, appropriately, contractually, transferring the risk of that to somebody else. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Planning. Can probably that can probably go into avoid, <coughs> avoid. Yeah. So, um, which is another category of risk management, right? Um, so, if you are planning, then you can say, I'm not going to plant my cut flowers in January because I want to avoid cold damage, yeah. right? So that would be avoiding, <laughs> but planning is it's very important. Uh, anything else? The other option, fourth option. Okay, it's kind of a non option. It's accept. Um, so you can say, for example, say if you diversified, right, you still have the risk of growing that crop, but you're, it's, it's at the level where you're willing to accept it. So anybody who's farming, you are kind of accepting the risk that you're going to have there. But like we said, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket and just accept all of the risk, like planting your cut flowers in January. That would be accepting all of the risk, but it's also not reducing it at all. So you have to be careful with the, with the accept. You have to accept at an acceptable level. Does that make sense? OK. So that was you know, managing this, these threats here um, and the, the negatives. So let's, let's go back to the actual SWOT analysis and let's talk about strengths, okay? So say for example, what are some things about your business or about you that might be strengths in growing beach plums? Or we can use Dave as an example. He will enjoy this. <laughs> Let, um, let's talk about some strengths. What are strengths? And you can even look at this a little bit, um, the green sheet. So there are different um, categories here, like a financial, marketing, personnel, production. Those are the, the categories that we list for strengths and weaknesses. Um, let's see, Dave, for his strengths, what does he have that other people don't have? Yes. Oh, he has that harvester. Yep. So he has equipment. What else does he have? Background in agriculture, absolutely. Farming experience. 
What else does he have? Labor. Labor. He somehow solved that issue. What was that? What? Chemical tolerance. Chemical tolerance. No, he does not like the spray. He not, does not enjoy it. He has a, a customer, a paying customer. Does Michael, bill pay, does Michael pay his bills on time? Yep. <laughs> I'll tell you a story real quick. Michael mentioned the man who makes the gin in Brooklyn. Called me up. Told me he was making it, wanted to make a beach bum flavored gin. He told me that he would pay me double what Michael pays me for the beach bums. He told me he would come down and he would pay cash and pick up the beach bums. And I gave it some thought. I don't know him. He was from Brooklyn, New York. He would buy my beach plums the first time. Michael has never turned down a lug of beach plums, I've said to him yet. The next time he would come down and say, well, some of them weren't right, but I couldn't use them. This is what I'm assuming, okay? And then I thought, and the third time he'll come down and say, here's a check, I don't have cash on me. <laughs> <laughs> I hedged my bet. I told him, if you want beach bums, you go to Michael Craig and buy them from him. Okay? Not double the price. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Why couldn't he buy them off, off of Michael? Go buy them right? Michael. Yeah, if he's going to double the price. He's going to double the price. Yeah. Okay? So that's, that's a good point. Um, we can just take a little Have step a away from the market. SWAT. Okay. He has a good relationship with his buyer, and this is actually a theme that we're seeing with these ultra niche pro crop project is the buyer, the chef. Michael's a gentleman. Yeah, Michael's a gentleman, absolutely. Um, but the buyer and the chef, like those kind of people are, it's very important to have a good relationship with them. Communication is key, and we're seeing this theme, like Jen and I are seeing this all the time. We had a conversation about it today. Can I have a show of hands of who would want to attend a future workshop where you actually would meet chefs and learn from them about and how to work with them? Yeah, how many people do we have? We have like half. Okay, so that might be forthcoming. Jen has to write the grant first to get that going. Um, all right, so you see how these are strengths about Dave and about his operation, right? So take stock. Optimistic. Okay. And that actually is really good in growing beach plums. <laughs> attitude. I can't spell that right now. OK. Um, so weaknesses. We don't have to talk about Dave, which you know there's not, there's not many. <laughs> um, but we can talk about weaknesses in general about a farmer. Um, so a lot of these are all the same categories, financial, marketing, personnel. Um, what are some weaknesses that we might ex be experiencing here in our region, in, in South Jersey? If you're a farmer and you want to grow beach plums, what are some of your weaknesses? Labor shortage. Labor shortage, yep. Access to labor, right? It's huge here. Um, lack of knowledge, yeah. prior knowledge of growing fruit trees, growing beach plums, or, or lack of education at this point, because you can... You can get that. Um, lack of market, like you don't have a developed market yet. Mm -hmm. Anything else? What was that? Oh, <laughs> Jen wants David all our class. OK, so you get the idea here? Taking stock of things about yourself that you might not have access to. Oh, lack of land we had, right? That's super important, too. What was that? Land? OK, now, opportunities. These are positive things that are not under your control that happen to be influencing you or could potentially influence your business. So uh, let's name some opportunities that we might have. Okay, so there is a building market in this region, right? We convinced the county freeholders to declare this official fruit. Yeah. County Even marketing. Get a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> this is the things you have to do. Right. You have to have a gimmick. You have to. So I think marketing is as big a part of it as growing. Uh -huh. 
Oh, yeah. Well, that's always true, right? What else do we have for opportunities? Okay, that's almost true. Hold on. There's two different kinds of Jersey Fresh. There's like the general Jersey Fresh, which is anybody who grows stuff in New Jersey, any produce, and you want to sell it, you can be in the Jersey Fresh program, you can get the marketing materials. If you want to be in the Jersey Fresh program, you need to be, your crop needs to be certified for certain quality standards. They do not have parameters for beach plums because there's not enough beach plum growers yet. So there is one grower who you know well uh, that is trying to get that into the Jersey Fresh program. But it's a local product, right? It's like a local, local option there. You said you're, the market is going to say emergency market or the market mm -hmm. No, there's definitely a market. Uh, Dave, how many, uh, how many, uh, Dave? Hey, Dave, yes. do you have any idea how many jars of jelly and jam Michael sells a year? I have no idea. Okay. I don't need to know. Okay. How many, how many pounds on average would you say you sell to him every year? He's taken everything up around for 10 years. Okay. The best year was the 18,000 pound year. Okay. He never blinked an eye. What's the worst year? Year before last. Mm. What was Weight wise? Yeah. Less than 2,000 pounds. Okay. Thanks. So the market, the, is, it might not be, it might be emerging for the country or for the region or whatever, but in Cape May County, there's absolutely a market here. We, we know that for sure. Uh, any other opportunities someone could think of? Yeah. Right, because it's a niche, right? Um, also, don't also lack the awareness of it in the rest of the country. Don't forget right. about the visitors. Michael touched on that. Right? Agritourism. Right, agritourism. Yes. So I was just going to say, I mean, fall is growing. Michael touched on that. He said, the only people down. interested would be able to have an awareness of it. Like, say, it was in August, a lot of people come down in September, October, even into November. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you guys noticing how our, our oh, really? tourism season is growing here? It's getting longer and longer and longer, and the beach pumps fit well into the fall, so it fit it can fit well into your harvesting. How about threats? Let's just real quick name threats to any agricultural business. Things you cannot control. Weather. Weather. <laughs> Always the top one. Uh. Yep. Like insects. You were crazy to get in this business, right? I had a nephew run over a beach palm tree with a golf cart. You had a what? A what? My nephew ran over. Oh my gosh, kids. <laughs> okay, how many more minutes do we have? Oh, good. Okay. So, let's go back now. Now, we've, uh, this is how you do your SWOT analysis. You get together with your business partners, your family, whoever you're working with, and you go through this analysis. You basically just go through this worksheet, right? So what you do first is you list all these, all these things. Then you go back and you figure out what can you do to take advantage of these things? How can you use these things that you have your strengths? So Dave has this equipment to his advantage, right? Um, he has experience. How can he capitalize on, on his experience when in his business? He could, he could do that. He could hire himself out to others. But these are things that, that he has that are special to him that really other people, nobody else in this room probably has this entire set of things, right? We know nobody else has the olive shaker. So he can continue to grow beach plums, right? Um, and he can, he can develop certain things. Like he can continue to develop his experience. Um, he can, he's got labor, which is a, a, hard, pro, a hard thing to have but he can make sure he maintains that, that strength. He capitalizes on it. Um, he can continue having this relationship with his customers. So for example, what if he sold his stuff to that guy in Brooklyn and then the next year ran out and the guy in Brooklyn, and, and Michael didn't have what he wanted? He would have burned his bridge with his best customer, right? So he, he, 
by he maintained that strength of keeping his customer and saying no to that guy that was a high risk, which could have been high return, could have gotten double, or he could have gotten nothing, but he took the, the high road and he stayed with his paying customer because he was capitalizing on his strength. We were contacted, the Beach Plum Association was contacted early on by Grey Goose for a Beach Plum flavored vodka. There was no way at that time nor at the present time that we could ever meet their demands, so we never pursued it. We just had to decline because that just there wasn't enough. You remember that, Les? Yeah, yeah. and just, like Dave is saying, you know, we have to grow the market as we grow the product. We have to improve. We don't want to promise something that we can't deliver on. Back to your point about niche marketing, um, Monty Spirits bought plums and created a plum infused drink with their vodka. Yeah, they did. It's all so over if you really look at it. You know, there's only a couple hundred pounds of plums, but Michael barely touched on it, but he also one of his big items is a beach plum favored martini and a beach plum flavored mojito. Mm -hmm. Yeah. High value. Yeah. All right, how about weaknesses? What can, what can we do about these if we have these things here? Take classes. Thank you, Miss Jennifer. <laughs> so you're doing that right now, right? What about um, your inexperience no in marketing? <laughs> or you're not wow. having a market? What can you do? Hmm? Okay, good. You get out there and you just do it, right? Yeah. And you learn about it. How about land? What can you do about land if you don't have land? Rent. Good job. Dave, what do you do about your land? How do you get it? How do I get it? Yeah. <laughs> do you own, I've got do you, it. Okay. Do you own the beach plum plantation well, I farm? I grow the ble beach plums. Curtis and I are partners together. They're on his property. I chose that site because of its proximity to the inland waterway mm -hmm. and the mini climate of that environment, of the uh, salt air, the humidities, the winds. Will they grow other places? Absolutely. It's kind of like the, the wine growers choosing the region or the, right. <clears throat> the wine growers in Cape May County now are applying to get their own, I, I always pronounce it wrong, oh. American Viticulture Area, ABA. Viticulture Area as the Cape May Peninsula because of the uniqueness of the heat sink effect of the Delaware Bay and the Atlantic Ocean, the moderate, somewhat moderate climate compared to even further up into, once you get to Vineland, the, the, while we do have cold weather, I'm not gonna tell you we don't, but the severity of it, the, the vines in Cape May County do not suffer the winter damage they do from Vineland North. Yeah. So because of the uniqueness of the Jersey Cape Peninsula, they're really close to, to achieving that, aren't they? Having that own, they're uh, now part of the coastal plain. Sort of. It's been applied for. We're just waiting on the feds. Yeah. Um, so the weaknesses, nobody wants to talk about this, right? Uh, and it's a little bit painful. And the other thing, it doesn't take a lot of land. Remember. Oh, for beach plums? You for mean? the beach plums. Right. <laughs> um, but you can see, you know, Dave, uh, basically, he rents, borrows, whatever, works this working relationship. He doesn't own that property, but he does have a relationship with the landowner, right? So you don't have to own your piece of property to do this. Um, but for the weaknesses, the good thing about listing them and going through and being honest about it is now you can work on it. Now you can figure out what you can do, and you can say to yourself, yeah, I know labor is one of my biggest problems. What am I going to do? Um, you know, whether you're going to hire someone, train someone, um, work with the FFA or whatever, um, you can just work on all these things. So it's really good to list them, even though it's not fun. Opportunities. <clears throat> In our area, we have a big, uh, this visitor situation, right? We have a big opportunity that's not capitalized on. Uh, Gary, you sell at community farmers so markets, right? Forget when you how me many the how many community question. farmers markets okay. do we have in our region that are dying for growers? For growers, okay. Well, we do eleven farmers markets a week, and that's all but two. So that's thirteen farmers markets. And they all need people, right? They all, they all need, need farmers. Yeah. We cannot grow enough 
fresh product in this county or even, I don't even think in the Cumberland County area, to meet the demand of the public. Because there's 800,000 people here in the summertime and how many people are farmers in this region? Not many. 12. <laughs> So we have a, a big opportunity here for direct retail that's still not capitalized on. So keep that in mind. And agritourism is huge. Les does um, hay ride, uh, pumpkin rides to, um, to pick your own stuff, but there's not too many people doing that in the county. We have a lot of demand for that. And then threats, we already talked about that, right? We already talked about you know, reducing these kind of threats. Weather, what do you do about the weather? No, none of this, except for the prey part. <laughs> the weather, you got to time them properly, right, to avoid damage. Um, you can insure for different crops. Um, and you can use things like high tunnels. Yeah, Tim? Can you insure for uh, beach plums? Some, some things on USDA. Yeah, but um, there are certain ways you can. There's like mixed. Uh, mixed, different mixed crop ones, like small acreage mixed crops. Um, and there's a couple of different things like that that you can actually, if you call um, FSA, they have a, a farm service agency in Vineland. They have a division that does crop insurance. Um, and what's the other one I'm thinking of? FSA. Oh, and there's independent crop insurance agents too. Um, these things, right, for insects, you can educate yourself, you can spray to protect. Um, you can plant resistant varieties, tolerant varieties, um, weeds. What can you do about weeds? Pull them, 